I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Uh, Abide Nadi Purdom is with the Davis Brown Law Firm in Des Moines. Prior to joining Davis Brown, he was with in house counsel at Principal Group. He received his JD from the University of Iowa, and I'll turn it over to Abide. Thank you, Christy, um, and welcome everybody uh, to this uh, presentation on the uh, attorney client privilege uh, and attorney work product. Um, I wanted to give a quick shout out before I begin to one of my colleagues, Sarah Franklin, who gave a similar presentation to this to uh, our attorneys here at Davis Brown about a year ago, and she graciously, graciously offered to share some of her materials with me. Uh, which were definitely helpful in, in guiding me through some of my research. Um, so thank you, Sarah, uh, for your help. Um, and we'll go ahead and begin. Um, so here are the topics that we'll be covering today. Um, I'll touch a bit on how attorney-client privilege, or ACP as I might refer to for short, has been part of our current events, politics, and even pop culture over the last few months, and then move on to the basics of attorney-client privilege, how it applies to in-house counsel, uh, waiver of the privilege, and then we'll end up with the basics uh, lend with the basics of uh, attorney work product. Um, so we throw the phrase ACP around a lot, uh, but we don't really discuss the basis. Um, the Supreme Court, uh, U.S. Supreme Court, has stated that the attorney-client privilege is the oldest of the privileges for confidential communications known to the common law. Its purpose is to encourage full and frank communication between attorneys and their clients and thereby promote broader public interests in the observance of law and administration of justice. Privilege recognizes that sound legal advice or advocacy serves public ends and that such advice or advocacy depends upon the lawyers being fully informed by the client. And that's from the Upjohn case, which we'll discuss uh, here shortly. And those of you who are in-house counsel are probably very familiar with that case, especially. Um, another source that I found uh, who discuss, who's discussed attorney-client privilege says that uh, the attorney-client privilege may be, well be the pivotal element of the modern American lawyer's professional functions. It is considered indispensable to the lawyer's function as advocate on the theory that the advocate can adequately prepare a case only if the client is free to disclose everything, bad as well as good. The privilege is also considered necessary to the lawyer's function as confidential counselor in law on the similar theory that the legal counselor can properly advise the client what to do only if the client is free to make full disclosure. So the bottom line is that the attorney-client privilege is known to be the oldest and possibly the most important doctrine in the practice of law. ACP and current events. Now, I know that most of you attending today CLE know what ACP and the attorney work product uh, doctrines are and why it's relevant to our day-to-day -day practice and our important ethical principles to follow, but what many may not realize is it's prevalent in our current events. Um, so I went ahead and typed attorney-client privilege into Google News when I was preparing this presentation just to see what would pop up. And I was surprised to find so many newsworthy stories about ACP. Now, one of those stories are, is particularly relevant uh, today, uh, considering the uh, indictments that have been handed down by uh, Special Prosecutor Mueller's uh, probe. Um, but uh, one of the first things that came up when I was, I was preparing for this store, or preparing for this presentation um, was from Reuters. Um, and the underlying story was actually reported by the New York Times. So as background, the New York Times broke a story about two White House lawyers to President Trump who were having lunch at a Washington, D.C. bistro and speaking quite candidly and loudly about requests made to them by special counsel, excuse me, special prosecutor Mueller's investigation team which is looking into, as all of you probably know, the alleged Russian interference in the 2016 elections. Well, what stemmed from that conversation was the question in the headline of this article, which is whether White House counsel can claim privilege when asked questions by the Mueller team about their conversations with the president, his family, or other close advisors. Um, the question of whether White House counsel can claim privilege hasn't actually been addressed by the Supreme Court, um, but if you look back in history, the, the issue of executive privilege was actually uh, discussed in United States versus Nixon. And in that case, the Supreme Court held that executive privilege gives way in criminal proceedings. So if there's a criminal proceeding that the government initiates as a result of the Mueller investigation, when the White House uh, then the White House counsel and the president cannot claim executive privilege. 
Um, but there's currently a circuit split uh, that's lasted about 12 years over whether governmental lawyers subpoenaed by a federal grand jury can invoke the attorney-client privilege. Um, and this circuit split actually stemmed from two notable events, uh, the Whitewater investigation in the 90s um, and an investigation into state procurement in Connecticut in the early 2000s. So at background, the, the Whitewater investigation was an investigation into Bill and Hillary Clinton's real estate investments as then governor and first lady of Arkansas in a real estate business called the Whitewater Development Corporation. Uh, there was an, an independent investigation led by a special prosecutor named Ken Starr, um, who was appointed by the president. Of course, that, present, that investigation was later taken over by a gentleman named Robert Ray. Um, but during the course of that investigation, there were subpoenas issued to various White House lawyers about their conversations and uh, with the President and Mrs. Clinton um, and documents pertaining to those conversations related to their investment of the Whitewater Development Corporation. The White House lawyers invoked attorney-client privilege and Ken Starr's team filed a motion to compel which eventually led to an appeal. So the name of this case is actually Enrique Grand Jury Deuces Takeum. And I've, I've put the site there for you to uh, look up on your own time if you'd like. Um, but the, the subpoenas that were issued were actually for, quote unquote, all documents created during meetings attended by an attorney from the Office of Counsel to the President, um, end quote, pertaining to several different subjects of the Whitewater investigation. The documents contain notes by White House Counsel Miriam Nemitz and Jane Sherburn. Because the subpoenas were issued in Arkansas, the appeals were filed in the Eighth Circuit. The Eighth Circuit said that the lawyers could not use the attorney-client privilege as a basis for refusing to turn over the documents. And in doing so, this is what they said. We believe the strong public interest in honest government and in, in, in exposing wrongdoing by public officials would be ill-served by recognition of a governmental attorney-client privilege applicable in criminal proceedings inquiring into the actions of public officials. We also believe that to allow any part of the federal government to use its in-house attorneys as a shield against the production of information relevant to a federal criminal investigation would represent a gross misuse of public assets. So the Eighth Circuit essentially balanced these competing interests of federal government attorneys needing to advise their clients, that is public officials, um, but also having responsibility to the public as a keeper and user of federal taxpayer dollars and resources. So, and, but in balancing those interests, they ended up favoring the interest of the transparency and said that attorneys could not raise the privilege as a basis for refusing to turn over documents. Excuse me, favor, ended up favoring the interests of uh, attorneys needing to uh, represent their clients, not transparency. Um, well, that takes us to another decision um, and, and shortly after the Whitewater investigation started, you may remember Ken Starr received an order to actually expand that investigation to investigate whether uh, Monica Lewinsky or others suburned perjury, obstructed justice, intimidated witnesses, or otherwise violated federal law in connection with uh, the civil lawsuit against the president filed by Ms. Paula Jones. So in January 98, the grand jury issued a subpoena to Bruce Lindsay, who at the time was deputy White House counsel and assistant to the president. Um, Lindsay appeared in front of a grand jury, uh, but he refused to answer certain questions, stating that the attorney-client privilege applied and it was not his privilege to waive. Ken Starr's team subsequently moved to Capel, which led to an appeal to the, the D.C. Circuit. The D.C. Circuit held that Bruce Lindsay had to answer the question about the advice he gave uh, Clinton during the course of the investigation. So again, here they favor transparency, um, and in doing so, they, this is what they said, said. I won't read it because it's a pretty long paragraph and it's in your materials, um, but again, feel free to take a look at it. Uh, they essentially held that uh, uh, what was more important in this scenario, even though lawyers have to service their clients, is that uh, there needs to be transparency on our federal government. Um, kind of following, following the Eighth Circuit's reasoning. Um, of note, the D.C. Circuit seemed to keep the door open with regard to privilege as a personal attorney to the president rather than an attorney acting in his or her capacity as a personal attorney, personal attorney, uh, or excuse me, a government attorney. So um, you'll see in this paragraph that the government uses the word intermediary to make this distinction. So um, if you look at it, uh, there might, the, the D.C. Circuit maybe um, was trying to 
leave open the, the door there to uh, personal attorneys. Now, following all of this, uh, if you want to fast forward to the early 2000s, uh, the Second Circuit uh, was forced to address the same issue, but this time with regard to state government attorneys' privilege with their client, the governor of Connecticut. Um, so in this case, which is called INRI Grand Jury Investigation, um, again, the site is in your materials. Uh, the, the case was about a, or the case was a 2005 Second Circuit decision where the court found that the governor of Connecticut's lawyer didn't have to testify to a grand jury about the advice she provided Governor John Rowland. Um, that case involved a U.S. Attorney's Office investigation into whether Governor Rowland um, and members of his staff received gifts from, the, from private individuals and entities in return for public favors, including favorable negotiation and awarding of state contracts. The Second Circuit addressed the same competing interests as Eighth Circuit, the whole idea of uh, transparency versus a lawyer needing to uh, do his or her job to protect uh, their client. Um, but the Second Circuit said that the D.C. and Eighth Circuits actually incorrectly balance those interests. Um, and in doing so, this is what they said. Um, so we, this, the circuit split was created, um, and this is kind of what we have right now, the current state uh, uh, of ACP in the government context. Uh, context excuse me. Um, now, an interesting thing to note is that the Clinton White House actually petitioned for cert um, on, on their decisions in the Eighth Circuit and the D.C. Circuit. Uh, that, cert, uh, that petition was denied, but um, keep in mind, and this is something that that Reuters article pointed out, um, the, that denial was obviously before the Mueller investigation. So um, clearly some of these cases uh, has the potential to get appealed um, on several grounds, but um, especially with regard to whether uh, these government attorneys have attorney-client privilege with um, with certain government officials, uh, even even the president. Um, so that's the the one particular story that that came up in current events. Um, another one that's come up and uh, which is also related to the federal government um, was this investigation. And, and here's a screenshot of that article. Um, you might have read that in March 2016, auditors in the House of Representatives' chief administrative office discovered uh, strange invoices for computer equipment. Uh, there were basically multiple purchases that were broken down into multiple payments of less than $500. And the, the rules in the House, um, and this could be federal government, all across federal government, is that any purchases over that amount require equipment to be placed on an inventory that helps track it, um, basically to avoid fraud. Um, the Inspector General's office received a referral, they investigated, they looked into it, um, and they found in September that there had been about 34 purchases totaling nearly $38,000, uh, where the cost of the item was manipulated to obtain a purchase price of $499.99. And this included iPads that were, you know, around $800 or TVs that were close to $700. Um, most of that equipment was left off the, the house inventory. The inv investigation uh, led to uh, the discovery that Imran Awan, who was an employee of the IT, IT department for the U.S. House of Representatives, was uh, the person kind of perpetuating the fraud with um, his spouse and um, uh, I believe his brothers as well. So. Uh, this led to uh, Mr. Imwan apparently leaving a bunch of uh, evidence in a phone booth and marked it attorney-client privilege. Um, right now, there's this fight uh, that, about whether that, that stuff is attorney-client privilege. As we'll review today, the evidence pointed on this article is likely not covered by the privilege, um, but I thought it was an interesting anecdote, again, to show that attorney-client privilege does, in fact, come up in various scenarios, uh, especially in our current events. Um, and finally, uh, this one was the, the most recent thing that came up uh, on, my, on my search. Um, and this is a, on a slightly different and arguably lighter note. Uh, the attorney client privilege actually came up last week when Kathy Griffin, who's a popular comedian, uh, had a Twitter feud with her lawyer. Um, this whole situation arose from an incident where Griffin released a picture of her holding a replica of President Trump's uh, severed head. Um, Griffin was criticized, rightfully so, and, and decided to apologize at a press conference with her attorney, Lisa Bloom, by her side. 
Now, if you YouTube that press conference video, you'll see that Ms. Bloom standing next to her and even said that, that Ms. Griffin would be making a statement. Um, but you'll also see that Ms. Griffin decided to go off cuff and rambled throughout the press conference, um, which was in, in June. Um, well, fast forward to this month in October, and Griffin publicly criticizes her attorney for not giving her good advice. Um, and her attorney decided to snap back and, and release that statement, which you should be able to see on your screen there, um, via Twitter. Now, some commentators are opining that Ms. Loom may actually have revealed confidential information and privileged attorney-client communication in violation of ethical rules and law. Um, but in order for this to actually become a thing, Griffin's going to have to bring an ethical complaint, which involves obviously some somersaults and other legal costs, but again, another interesting example of attorney-client privilege being implicated in our current events, and in this case, our, our pop culture. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and move on uh, to the basics of ACP uh, under Iowa law. Now, one thing I just wanted to point out was that the important thing to realize with attorney-client privilege is that it is a privilege, and that privilege belongs to a client, and that privilege can't be waived uh, unless the client the client waives it. So any any communication uh, that 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 qualifies as attorney-client privilege, which again we'll go through here in a little bit, um, that communication shouldn't be disclosed uh, unless the client waives the privilege, um, and uh, there's some understanding at least between the parties to the extent uh, of the waiver of that privilege. Um, so the elements of ATP under Iowa law: uh, three basic elements. Communication is subject to ACP when it is made between an attorney and his or her client in confidence uh, for the purpose of seeking, obtaining, or providing legal assistance or advice. Um, so let's break these down a little bit. Uh, let's go ahead and talk for, about the first element, um, which is uh, the attorney-client relationship and what that actually entails. So the attorney-client relationship has three separate elements. Um, in order for an attorney-client privilege to exist, a person had to have sought advice from an attorney. Uh, that advice uh, was within the attorney's professional competence, and the attorney expressly or impliedly gave the desired advice. Right, so this is to meet the first element of an attorney-client relationship. Excuse me, first element of uh, privilege. The second element, that the communication had to be made in confidence. Now, generally speaking, uh, in confidence means that the communication was made without the presence of any third parties. However, there are some exceptions to this general rule. And here are a couple of them. The exceptions include the following. Uh, if the person or persons who are present are essential for the rendition of a legal opinion, then confidence is not broken. Also, if independent contractors for the client who provided advice and guidance on the issue at stake in the matter are present, the confidence will not be broken. Now, these exceptions are interesting to consider in the Kathy Griffin context we were just talking about because we don't really know who was in the room when Bloom gave legal advice to Griffin. Now, there's a case that I pointed out in your references page, which is towards the end of the presentation. Um, it's called In Re Beater Company. Um, and in that case, the Eighth Circuit found that an independent contractor who provided, quote unquote, advice and guidance regarding commercial and retail development based upon his knowledge of commercial and real retail business in the state of Minnesota was akin to an outside accountant for her knowledge in, for example, proper practices and taxation concerning partnerships. So the court ruled in that case that the contractor was a lot like an employee of the company who the company's lawyer would obtain information from when representing the company. So the attorney and the client expected the lawyer's conversation with that independent contractor to be confidential. Um, likewise, in the Griffin example, it may be that uh, maybe the photographer who took Griffin's picture or her publicist who set up the photography session was in the room when Griffin uh, sought Bloom's legal advice. Um, so if there's any litigation involving Ms. Involving Bloom and Griffin, um, about what happened in that meeting. There could be privilege issues that pop up uh, due to the presence of Griffin's team members. Um, if any of those individuals were there to provide additional background information so that Ms. Bloom could, could render legal advice. Um, we could also ponder how these exceptions might apply to the Mueller investigation considering that 
many of the meetings the White House counsel had or has with the president usually involves advisors or um, could in also include family members. Uh, so perhaps privilege won't even be an issue in those situations um, because privilege may, may not even exist. Again, uh, I think it's something that, that can probably come up and might even be debated. Um, another exception uh, that, that commonly comes up are exceptions uh, for, for family members of clients. Um, so especially here in Iowa, litigators run into this a lot where, uh, and even transactional lawyers for that, for that matter, um, where there are presence of family members in meetings, um, so this might be in the context of family law or estate planning or um, litigation involving maybe like a family-owned business. Um, so on the left-hand side of this table, you'll see the family member listed, and then on the right side of the table, you'll see the answer to the question of whether privilege exists um, when that particular family member uh, is in the room with the client and his or her attorney. Um, so spouses and minor children are almost always considered acceptable third parties to be present, um, but the presence of other family members, including adult children, may actually break that privilege. Of course, just like with most things, um, there is some gray area among the presence of adult children. Um, the courts have said where the client parent needs their adult children to help them communicate with their attorney, um, uh, an exception actually exists. So. Um, a good example of this is actually a personal story. My, my parents immigrated here from India. Uh, my brother and I were both, were both born here, but my grandparents came back and forth quite a bit and actually received their green cards. Um, and uh, one of my grand grandfathers actually became a citizen after holding his green card for the required period of time. And I remember distinctly sitting in, in meetings with my parents when I was a kid um, and my grandfather, when, when they were speaking with an immigration attorney about the citizenship process. So um, although my grandfather spoke English, um, he still needed assistance kind of understanding the American legal system and, uh, and, and even having some of those English words translated into our, into our native language, Kannada. Um, so it's kind of an interesting example, probably something that occurs quite often in the immigration context in the United States. Um, so another thing that often comes up with regard to the second element, the, the issue of whether the communication occurred in confidence is, is joint representation. So one practice pointer for those uh, in private practice, if, if you're jointly representing two or more clients, make sure you execute a common interest agreement or a joint defense agreement or a joint representation agreement to ensure that, that privilege is maintained. Um, and the ABA actually has examples of joint agreements, joint representation agreements uh, on their website um, that I've, I've referenced before in the past. Um, and another thing to keep in mind, though, when, when representing uh, joint parties is that um, while the, the conversation that, that two uh, clients may have with each other about the legal advice you've provided is likely privileged. If that conversation is purely factual in nature, then the communication is likely not covered by ACP. And what I mean by factual in nature is that um, if two employees were talking to each other, for example, let's say in the in-house context about an incident at work, but were simply talking about what they saw and not about necessarily the legal advice you provided them as an in-house lawyer uh, about the incident or uh, about what to do, um, that could that could actually not be covered by privilege, um, that the communication with each other with those, the, between those two employees. So um, something to keep in mind when you're representing um, joint clients. Uh, another thing that uh, came up in my research that I thought would be helpful is uh, documents and attorney-client privilege. Just, just because your client forwards you something um, and marks it as attorney-client privilege information, it doesn't mean that um, you are you you can uh, mark them as privileged, or they are in fact privileged, and and not disclose them. So uh, remember the the third element when when considering uh, situations like this, which is the communication must be to obtain legal advice in order for it to be privileged. So um, it's one thing if your client is forwarding you something and saying, um, "Hey, Abai, I, re I I found these documents. Um, you know, this is pursuant to." your request for me to look through documents uh, for the for response to discovery uh, 
or um, I have particular questions about this, how does uh, this legal theory apply to this particular document. Um, if they're simply just kind of forwarding it to you because they don't want to disclose it, uh, and they mark this privilege, it's, it's probably not privileged. So uh, another interesting anecdote. The next thing, exception I want to talk about uh, with regard to the attorney-client privilege is uh, the, the crime fraud exception. And, and before we move any further, I want to uh, play a quick clip. Um, and for those of you who have dialed in on the phone, you may not hear it if your volume's not turned up on your computer, but I'll explain the clip uh, after it's played so uh, those of you uh, who weren't able to hear it can, can understand. Okay, so I thought that would be kind of an entertaining way to break up the presentation a little bit, but um, for those of you who weren't able to hear, basically that, that clip is from the, Link, the movie The Lincoln Lawyer, Matthew McConaughey. Um, is, is, a, is a lawyer, is a criminal defense lawyer in that movie. Um, Ryan Felipe is his client. Um, and uh, during that interaction, Ryan Felipe had, had creeped into Matthew McConaughey's uh, house or apartment um, and then basically admitted to, uh, admitted to the murder um, that, the, that Matthew McConaughey was defending him in, um, defending him for, excuse me. And um, the, the question is, was, is, was Lewis, who was played by Ryan Felipe, um, was he correct? Was he correct in saying that, how basically admitting to the murder and then uh, saying attorney-client privilege uh, applies? Um, remember, the attorney-client privilege does not extend to communications made for the purpose of getting advice for the commission of a fraud or crime. So uh, really the rule we want to look at is, at least under the Iowa rules, is the Iowa Rule of Professional Responsibility 32, uh, 1.6b. A lawyer may reveal information to the extent that the lawyer reasonably believes necessary to prevent the client from committing a crime or fraud uh, that is reasonably certain to result in substantial injury to the financial interests or property of another and in furtherance of which the client has used or is using the lawyer's services. So the crime fraud exception is, isn't, uh, doesn't allow, as, for example, a criminal defense attorney to say um, or, or disclose the fact that his or her client might have actually committed the crime, um, but the lawyer may reveal the information to the extent that the lawyer reasonably believes that it's necessary to prevent the client from committing that crime or fraud. I want to touch a little bit on uh, ACP for in-house counsel today. Um, I spent uh, some time as in-house counsel at, at, at Principal Financial Group, as Christy noted uh, in the introduction. Um, which was kind of an interesting experience from an ACP standpoint. It, it'll, it made me kind of look into the area a little bit um, just because uh, the role of a lawyer in-house, as uh, some of you may know or recognize, um, is a little bit different. Um, and it's different for this purpose, and this was actually uh, written by the Northern District of California. The realities of corporate structure are such that an in-house attorney may be charged both with assessing the legal aspects of a transaction and implementing that transaction. Because in this way, in-house counsel operate in both a legal and a business capacity, it is our view that an in-house attorney may act as the attorney for purposes of one communication and as the client for purposes of another. So the point here being is that um, the, the difficulty for, for in-house counsel is that they have a role, they, have a, they wear one hat as a lawyer for the company, but oftentimes they, they wear another hat or they're wearing both hats in assisting the, the business uh, run and, and, and assisting with some of those business decisions in their, while also acting in this capacity as a lawyer. So the test for in-house uh, lawyer communication with their clients um, has kind of evolved. Uh, over time. Um, so we'll start with uh, the corporate control test, which is, was the first test that, that evolved um, for in-house counsel. Uh, in this case, uh, which is City of Philadelphia v. Westinghouse Electric Corp., the, the, court, the court came up with a test and basically said that ACP only applies to those conversations between in-house lawyers and those employees who are controlling executives and managers of the corporation. Um, now, this case was, uh, it's in your notes, feel free to, to take a look at it, but 
um, basically what the court said was, to quote them, if the employee making the communication is in a position to control or even to take a substantial part in a decision about any action which the corporation may take upon the advice of the attorney or if he is an authorized person with that authority, then in effect he is or personifies the corporation when he makes his disclosure to the lawyer and the privilege would apply. In all other cases, the employee would be merely giving information to the lawyer to enable the latter to uh, advise those in the corporation having the authority to act or refrain from acting on the advice. So the presumption with this test is that only certain people at the top of a corporate ladder are making decisions and the information from people uh, who are on the lower rungs of the corporate ladder are not necessarily making decisions. Um, so they can't really provide information for the purpose of obtaining legal advice. Um, now the test uh, evolved and it evolved into uh, what is the subject matter test. Um, Harper, which is noted here, Harper was a case uh, that consolidated about 40 cases um, against 23 publication companies. Um, and in those cases, the plaintiffs were alleging that companies conspired to inflate the cost of children's editions library books. The plaintiffs wanted a uh, particular memoranda that it, the attorneys for the defendants prepared while debriefing a number of the employees and former employees of the publishers shortly after each of them testified in front of a grand jury um, that was investigating the defendants for antitrust violations. Um, the district court allowed the plaintiffs to see the memoranda pursuant to the control group test, which is what we talked about, holding that the memoranda was not covered by attorney-client privilege because many of the people debriefed by the attorneys had supervisory or policy-making responsibilities. The Seventh Circuit held that the control group test is not adequate, was not adequate because there was some attorney-client privilege communication that may arise out of a special group of people within the company. So it instead adopted the subject matter test and held that the real inquiry should be whether the employee communicated with the attorney at the discretion of the employer and on its behalf and the communication was germane to the duties of his employment. Um, now, the, the, this issue eventually went up to the Supreme Court, um, as I quoted earlier, the Upjohn case, which is kind of the, the case about this subject. Um, and in that case, the court rejected the control group test um, and, and came up with the test that's on your screen here today. So just to give you some background, the Up, uh, Upjohn was, a, was actually a pharmaceutical company. And during one of its independent audits uh, of one of its subsidiaries, an accountant for Upjohn discovered that the subsidiary uh, made an improper payment to uh, or for the benefit of foreign government officials in order to secure government businesses, excuse me, business. The accountants informed uh, Upjohn's general counsel who then decided to conduct an internal investigation. And as part of that investigation, the attorneys prepared a letter containing a questionnaire which was sent to quote unquote, all foreign general and area managers. The letter was signed by the chairman of the company's board, and the company later voluntarily submitted a report to the SEC disclosing these payments and a copy of the report that was uh, uh, actually also sent to the IRS. Um, the federal special agents who were uh, uh, kind of overseeing this investigation um, uh, were uh, given a list of all the people who responded to the questionnaire as well. Um, the IRS then demanded production of the questionnaire responses, but the, the company objected. So this went uh, to, I think at the time, a magistrate judge, um, and uh, the magistrate judge decided uh, that the company needed to disclose the questionnaire responses because uh, Upjohn waived attorney-client privilege by issuing the questionnaire in the first place. The district court adopted that decision. The case then went up to the Sixth Circuit. Um, the Sixth Circuit disagreed. The Sixth Circuit said that uh, uh, that they disagreed about the waiver issue, but held that the privilege, attorney-client privilege, didn't apply basically pursuant to the control group test. Now, remember, that test says that the privilege only applies to communicate it, communication between in-house counsel and employees who are controlling executives or managers of the corporation, people with decision-making authority. 
the U.S. Supreme Court rejected that test and applied basically a version of the subject matter test. And you'll see that subject matter portion um, in, in the second prong of the test on your screen. Ultimately, the court held that the district court uh, and the magistrate used too lenient of a standard, remanded the case, and ordered the district court to use this test to determine whether uh, the questionnaire responses uh, were privileged. So this is what the Supreme Court um, has used in, in the context of, of in-house lawyers. Um, now, under Iowa law, um, the, the case that in-house counsel want to refer to is, is Keefe v. Bernard. Um, and, and Keefe is basically the subject matter test. Um, and when they're saying here in the first line that we agree with the U.S. Supreme Court, they're agreeing with the court in Upchon um, that the corporate attorney-client privilege should not be limited to those in the control group. Instead, the test must focus on the substance and purpose of the communication. If an employee of a corporation or entity discusses his or her own actions relating to potential liability of the company, such communications are protected by the attorney-client privilege. If, on the other hand, a corporate employee is interviewed as a witness to the actions of others, the communication should not be protected by the corporation attorney-client privilege. So um, uh, another kind of example of this uh, for in-house lawyers and I guess all lawyers is looking at Rule 32.1.6a, uh, um, which uh, is just another source of the attorney-client privilege. Um, and at least one federal court has actually cited to this rule in the context of um, attorney-client privilege uh, in the in-house context. Um, and uh, that case is actually still, still Mooncas v. Gavaudan Flavors Corp. Um, and the Westlaw number for that is 2009-WL-936605. Um, so some, with all that being said, uh, here's some practice pointers for in-house counsel. Um, in any written communication, establish that legal advice is being provided. So the, try not to intermingle business and legal advice in the communications. Um, Express what you're, that you're acting in your capacity as an in-house lawyer rather than in your business capacity. Um, so maybe you wear two hats. Maybe you're an executive VP and general counsel, or maybe you're a VP and associate general counsel. Um, uh, make it clear that you're, you're acting in your legal capacity. Um, and when in-house counsel needs something from an employee, speak with the employee directly to make that communication privilege. Um, you know, if we go back a couple slides here, as, as the Keefe Court said, if, on the other hand, a corporate employee is interviewed as a witness to the actions of others, the communication should not be protected by the corporation's attorney-client privilege. Um, if, if, for whatever reason, you think that there's a, a particular employee who, who might be implicated, um, just, just reach out to them directly and get their advice. Something that we talked about earlier, too, when it comes to joint representation, um, you know, you don't necessarily want um, managers going out and, and getting the information if you can prevent it. Maybe get the names of the, the lower level employees um, who have uh, the information and, and speak to them directly. Um, and, and there is actually case law that is uh, pretty prevalent around the country that basically says that um, that communication between managers and, and lower level employees aren't, uh, aren't necessarily privileged. So just reach out to the employee directly and, and talk to them. Um, and then, obviously, remind employees that the communication between themselves about legal matters, um, but that is not about the advice that you provide is likely not privileged. So um, they may talk about things with each other, things that happened in the company, um, things that happened um, in the course of, of conducting business. Um, they, they really need to limit those conversations um, because they may not be privileged down the road. Um, and the, the last thing I'll say again about the attorney-client privilege is that remember that it is a privilege and that it belongs to the client and that if the client doesn't waive it, that communication cannot be produced. So uh, that is the, the ultimate reason why we're talking about all of this today. So the waiver of the attorney-client privilege. Um, so under the Iowa Rules of Evidence uh, and uh, the corresponding federal rule, 502, um, uh, attorney-client privilege and work product um, have uh, particular limitations on, on their waiver. So I won't go through the, the rule here word for word. Um, I, I, I want to point you to it, though, just to make sure you're aware of it. Um, 
and and also the note at the bottom of the screen there. Now, engineered products was a, a patent infringement case that contained uh, that contains a pretty lengthy set of facts. But but the purpose of me including it here is to note that even if waiver occurs, it only applies to the documents and subjects that are linked to the subject matter in the waived communication. So the disclosure doesn't simply open up the door to all of their privileged communication. Um, so that's the only thing I'll, I'll, I'll note with that. Um, the rule is pretty lengthy. It also covers inadvertent disclosures. Um, and then uh, it covers what, uh, how matters that have been disclosed in a federal or state proceeding um, uh, that is not in the subject of the, the court order concerning the waiver, how, how that information is handled as well. Um, the controlling effect of a court order uh, discussing the, the the waiver or the disclosure, and then any any uh, party agreement that might occur. So um, one thing that you may want to consider if if there's certain information that needs to be disclosed, um, or if you are comfortable with disclosing certain information that is attorney-client privilege, um, put into place an agreement uh, with the other party. Um, of course, those agreements it can can vary from case to case, but um, you know that allows you to maybe disclose particular things, um, but not disclose others. Uh, so it, it is an avenue that that you can pursue to disclose uh, particular matters. Um, so let's move on to attorney work product. Um, what is attorney work product? Well. Uh, Defined here in Rule 1. Point, I Rule of Civil Procedure 1.503, uh, which states that documents and tangible things otherwise discoverable, discoverable under Rule 1.5031 and prepared in anticipation of litigation or for trial by or for another party or by or for that other party's representative, including the party's attorney, consultant, surety, indemnitor, insurer, or agent. Now, under Iowa law, the rule provides kind of two layers of protection for attorney work product. So first, the party seeking discovery of the attorney work product uh, needs to show, quote unquote, substantial need, and that it is unable without undue hardship to obtain the substantial equivalent of the materials by other means. Um, the other layer of protection is that mental impressions or opinions of the lawyer is, for all practical purposes, um, uh, are absolutely immune from discovery. Now, the most prevalent issue in attorney work product disputes is about whether the product was quote unquote prepared in anticipation of litigation. And one case is particularly helpful to hash this issue out, um, and that's the case on the slide here, which I'll refer to as, as well as dairy. Um, now, the underlying facts of this case involved an explosion at a Wells Dairy ice cream plant in Lamar's. Uh, and sometime after the explosion, the CEO of Wells Dairy uh, asked some professors at uh, the University of Wisconsin uh, to uh, create a report um, that would be kept confidential and not used in litigation. And the report addressed three main questions. Um, is refrigeration a core competency for Wells Dairy? Uh, how competent is Wells Dairy Inc. in the area of refrigeration? And looking toward the future, what refrigeration capabilities should Wells possess? Um, so if you think about those kind of on their face, they don't really sound like uh, you know questions necessarily pertaining to litigation. So anyway, during discovery, Wells Dairy objected to a request for production from the subcontractor for the refrigeration system um, for you know all documents that weren't specifically requested by uh, the document request, but which nonetheless refer to or relate to the project or incident. Um, so kind of this general request um, about about uh, documents pertaining to the to the explosion. Well, Jerry objected um, to that on the grounds that it, it called for um, information prepared in anticipation of litigation, which uh, encompasses this report. Um, and during the deposition of the Wells Dairy refrigeration engineer, the subcontractor learned of the report. Um, and uh, upon kind of learning about it, asked about it, but the Wells Dairy attorney objected uh, to questions about it 
on the basis of uh, attorney work product. Now, uh, the subcontractor then moved to compel, um, and Wells resisted, saying his work product, and the district court granted the motion to compel, um, and this went up to, uh, to the Supreme Court on interlocutory appeal. And uh, applying the test on this slide, the Supreme Court agreed with the district court that the report was not prepared in anticipation of litigation. Uh, the court held that the report was created for business purposes rather than for litigation purposes. Um, and it agreed with uh, it, it agreed with the district court. Um, the district court stated that although the investigation and report was ordered by Wells after the explosion, its stated purpose and goals have nothing to do with the explosion or the manner in which litigation should be addressed. Um, so uh, the the key point here is that um, is the is after the ellipses. The documents would have been created in essentially similar form, irrespective of litigation. It cannot fairly be said that they were created because of actual or impending litigation. So, what prepared in anticipation of litigation means that it had to have been prepared because of actual or impending litigation in order for it to be uh, work product. Um, so that kind of answers. There was there was one question that that has come in um, since uh, I've been doing the presentation. Are joint defense agreements between co-defendant attorneys recognized in Iowa as as work product privilege? Um, well, it, it's it's cr the, the document was created because of actual or impending litigation. Um, I don't know the exact answer to that question. Um, I'd have to I'd have to look into it. It's a, it's a good question, um, but I would say that uh, if it since it was prepared because of actual litigation, um, it probably is work product. Um, and so here's some of the general rules that that of prepared in anticipation of litigation. So it must have been prepared in light of litigation or credible prospect of litigation. Um, the courts have said that it needs to be specific litigation, not litigation generally. So you can't simply say, um, well, well, yeah, this, this report was created because our company is generally in litigation. It has to be with, uh, with regard to specific forms of litigation or specific cases or specific lawsuits. Um, the party asserting attorney work product must provide a detailed privilege log stating that the, the basis for the privilege and the burden is first on the party seeking the information. So the party seeking the information must show the substantial need and undue hardship we discussed earlier. Um, so this means that the party must make an independent discovery effort to obtain the information, the same information, and show that that information is not obtainable through discovery already produced, depositions, or any other source. And again, those cases, uh, put footnotes there, uh, there's reference to slides, feel free to take a look at those cases, cases on your own um, that, that refer to these general propositions. Um, there is a waiver of attorney work product. Uh, again, that's governed by I Rule of Evidence 5.502. Um, please take a look at that rule. Um, there's also the federal, corresponding federal rule, which is Rule 502. Um, and I really don't have much to say about that besides uh, just, just take a look at that uh, when, when you can or when you run into the issue. Finally, there's a reference to slide uh, with, the, with the case law. If it wasn't spelled out in the actual slide, uh, I've placed, placed that here. Um, and if there aren't any other questions, uh, we'll go ahead and conclude. Um, thank you very much for tuning in today, uh, and I uh, hope you have a great afternoon.